Welcome back to Applied Mathematics. In this video, we're going to be reducing radicals. All right. So the idea here is tied closely to the idea of fractional exponents. Remember, x to the m over n power is the same thing as the nth root of x to the m. And so we can occasionally use this to our advantage. For example, if I have the fourth root of x to the sixth power, well, that's the same thing as x to the 6 over 4 power, and 6 over 4 reduces to 3 over 2. And now, using that property of fractional exponents, this is the square root of x to the third power. There is one thing that you have to worry about a little bit here, and that's to do with negative values. Right? Because I was taking the sixth power in the first place, whether x was positive or negative to start, taking the sixth power of it is going to give me a positive value. And then taking a fourth root of a positive value is no problem. But then in the final result, I have a third power. And if I take the third power of a negative number, I get a negative value out. For example, if I have x equals 2, I'm sorry, x equals negative 2, negative 2 cubed is negative 8. And then there's no such thing as the square root of negative 8. I mean, there is, but it involves imaginary numbers, and we don't want to deal with imaginary numbers if we can avoid it. So, there's a couple of ways to deal with that. By and large, I'm going to have instructions like, assume that x is greater than or equal to 0. Now you don't have to worry about it. There are no negative values of x, so nothing is going to come up. Is that a reasonable assumption? Well, that depends on your starting point. A lot of the times when fractional exponents come up, when radicals come up in any shape or form, it tends to come up from geometric processes, where your variables are representing distances, or maybe time elapsed. Speaking generally, these are measurements that tend to make sense as positive values and not make sense as negative values. So there are a lot of applications where that is a perfectly reasonable approximation to make. Not every, but a lot of them and enough of them that it's a worthwhile just blanket statement. We'll assume that our variables are positive, that will allow us to do the things we want to do in this lesson, and if you have a situation where negative variables are a possibility, then you have to stop and think about it a little bit harder. The other thing that this allows us to do is evaluate radicals that have more going on. For example, the square root of 25x to the fourth. Well, that's the same thing as 25x to the fourth to the one-half power. Now, using properties of exponents, that's 25 to the one-half times x to the fourth to the one-half. 25 to the one-half is the square root of 25. x to the fourth to the one half is x to the four over two. The square root of 25 is five, and four divided by two is two. So this radical simplifies to five x squared. Those are the ideas that we're going to be thinking about when we talk about reducing a radical. The examples that you see most often are going to involve just numbers and no variables. This is the sort of thing that I often call an answer only a mathematician could love. If I take 24 
Well, I know that 24 is the same thing as 6 times 4, and I can split that up. Square root of 6 I can't really do anything with. Square root of 4 is 2, and then it's more commonly written with the um, whole part in front, and we'll call it 2 square root of 6. So we've gotten an exact value here. This is one of those places where a calculator can be incredibly valuable. Not every calculator, but a lot of calculators have a pretty print feature. So if I put the square root of 24 into my calculator, it gives me 2 times the square root of 6. This doesn't mean that you don't need to be able to do this by hand. Um, although I guess kind of it does. Right. There is no reason to look at the square root of 24 and work through this process by hand. There's especially no reason if we have some really ugly numbers. Right. If I want to take the square root of um, 2,450, I could walk through and try to figure that out, but I really don't want to, right? I can say, well, that's uh, 245 times 10, and 245 ends in a 5, so I guess that's going to be um, 49 times 5 times 10, and then I can rewrite that as 49 times 25 times 2. And sure, I was able to do it by hand, but that was not fun. And I was able to do it by hand in large part because I knew what I was doing. I wrote the problem in the first place. Hmm, that's actually very interesting to me. This calculator apparently can't handle dealing with this one by hand because the number is just too big. I'm kind of curious what's going to happen here if I divide by 35 and then say give me a pretty print. And no, it's still giving up even though that is decimal square root of 2. Alright, so I guess there we have it. There are numbers that get big enough that the calculator can't handle. And being able to do it by hand is useful in that sense. Um, but is it useful, right? Why would you ever want to write 2 square root of 6 or 35 times the square root of 2 instead of writing 4.8 or 49 point whatever that was? Well, honestly, I don't know. Other than math class, there's no reason for that. There's no value to it. But it is a valuable practice. Using that as a way of getting accustomed to these kinds of manipulations. Working with numbers tends to make more sense to most people than working with variables. All right, so if I have the square root of x to the 7th, I might want to rewrite that as the square root of x to the 6th times the square root of x because I know that the square root of x to the 6 is going to be x to the 3rd. Right? I can go through and write out the fractional exponents if I want to, but I know that taking the square root of an even power is going to divide it by 2. And if I have a little bit more involved, the square root of 75x cubed. Well, I see right away that I have an x squared and I have an x that I can split that up. And then the 75, that takes a little bit more thought, that takes a little bit more number sense. But 75 is 25 
times 3. Square root of 25 is 5, square root of x squared is x, and then we have the square root of 3x left over. So using uh, square roots of whole numbers and giving an exact value, again, not something you're ever going to see in industry, but it's a good practice. It's a good warm up before you get into these expressions that contain variables. The variables themselves are a great warm up for dealing with dimensional analysis. It is incredibly common to have units that are squared underneath a square root. For example, there is a common formula in physics, the kinetic energy is one half times mass times velocity squared. Rearranging this equation, you get that velocity squared is two times the kinetic energy and I should stress here, KE is one variable, two letters. It's one of those annoying, confusing things, but we can work with it. It's fine. And then V itself is the square root of two KE over M. There's a positive or negative thing that you have to worry about, but we're once again, working under the assumption that all variables are positive. If the possibility of a negative variable came up, we would have to revisit these whole ideas and we'd have to be a lot more careful. But um, if we can make that assumption, it makes life so much easier. I am going to keep stressing it because it's something we can do right now. It's not necessarily something we can do for the rest of the course, let alone for other courses you may be taking in the future. Right. But anyway, we have this formula for the velocity of an object given its kinetic energy and given its mass. So if we plug in a couple of relevant values, for example, we might have an object that has a kinetic energy of uh, 235 joules and a mass of 12 kilograms. Well, I can punch in the um, numbers into my calculator, 2 times 235 divided by 12. And that comes out as this ugly decimal number, 39.2. I'll give it three significant figures. It looks like that's what we have. And then hidden in here, and again, I don't expect you to know this, this is not a physics class, but a joule is a kilogram meter square per second squared. The kilograms cancel out, and we're left with units of meter squared over second squared. Then I can take the square root of that numerical value, my calculator is happy to do that part for me, it gives me uh, 6.26, and then I think about the units. The square root of meters squared is meters. The square root of seconds squared is seconds. And when I'm dealing with units, I know that I never have any weird things with negatives to worry about. It's nonsense to think about negatives with units of measure. Right? Meters can never be negative. A measurement can give you a negative number of meters, but a meter itself is not a negative value. That's, that's nonsense. A meter itself is uh, the distance across, right, shoulder to shoulder, roughly speaking. Right. So these are the kinds of reasons that the process can be useful. So as you're going through, as you're going through examples and practice problems, sure, we can simplify expressions. We can uh, solve equations and rewrite things in some very powerful ways. But the end goal is really dimensional analysis. Being able to take something like this and recognize what's happening to the units and make sure that the units are doing the thing you expect them to do. All right. With that, I think I'm going to wrap this one up. As always, thank you for joining me. I'll see you next time.